We have questions from the fall final exam that you have in that <coughs> review sheet. Hopefully you brought a copy. If not, maybe your neighbor has one. Otherwise, you certainly can just follow along. Everything that's up on the screen is what's on the sheet, so you don't have to try to write that all out if you want to take any notes. And we'll go through these questions with a few tangent ideas, too. So the exam is 10 pages in length, 13 questions. Your semester exams were eight pages in length, but we have now regression, which takes up a page of output practically. And a number of other graphs that come up now with residual plots, scatter plots, and so on, box plots side by side. So I do expect it to be longer. I do expect you to take a little bit longer than a semester exam, but you have two hours to take this one and not just an hour and a half. When you look through a problem, you, know, you read the background, and that should give you some guidance as to what area you're talking about for this problem. But the output would probably give you some clue, or maybe some of the questions that are asked later on, too, might help. We're looking here at costs for insurance, trying to assess whether maybe online insurance would be cheaper than the local. So 10 clients have been selected in their profile for what they have for insurance used to determine the price locally versus online to make some comparisons. So we have local versus online and summaries about the average prices for each set. I see paired samples here as the output provides. Does it make sense that this is a paired data situation? You have prices for the 10 clients, both online and local. Both of those two prices for that first one go to that first person or first client in their profile. So it is a paired design. For the 10 profiles in our study, we want to know what the average savings would be by switching to online. I can see that the local prices were indeed higher. They had a higher mean, 9, 798 compared to 752. So indeed, there is a difference there, but that difference was also calculated for us right down here. There's the mean of the differences. About a $45 savings if I were to use the online compared to the local. Local's higher by $45. So that's just pulling off that quantity. What's the symbol for that quantity? This is an estimate of that true parameter, but its symbol for it as an estimate is D bar, the sample mean difference. Now we'll likely use this data to do either a confidence interval or maybe to do some hypothesis test. Hypothesis testing is what was mentioned in the next part, that we want to test hypotheses about whether it really is cheaper to go online or not. What would be the symbol that I would put in H0 and HA? Not D bar, but mu sub D, you've got it in part B. Mu sub D equal to zero would be our null hypothesis. The equal always goes in H0, and usually the value is a zero when you're looking at a comparative design. What would I want for a direction to assess whether or not online was cheaper? Differences were local minus online, and if online is cheaper or lower, then my differences should be positive in general. Now to conduct any hypothesis test or confidence interval for any of our inference techniques, there are conditions that have to be met. And the second question was asking regarding those conditions. It gives you a plot that could be used to check one of the assumptions, and you're asked here to state that assumption. Not check the assumption, and tell me whether it looks okay or not, but to state it. So what do we see? This is a QQ plot of the differences in our sample, the 10 differences. What is this used to check? QQ plots are used to check for the assumption of normality, the normality of some population. In this case, it's the population of all differences that are assumed to be normal. So here we're checking that the population of all differences in prices in this case it's local minus online 
The assumption is that the population of all differences in prices has a normal model. or a normal distribution. That the model for the prices, differences in prices, is normally distributed. Now, if I did ask you to tell me what you think, does that assumption seem reasonable, what would you say? You're looking to see what? If I ask you how would you check, I would look at the QQ plot, see if the points start to fall along, straight line with a positive slope. If that is the case, then it would be reasonable to say the assumption holds. So would you circle that it seems to be valid here? Yeah. And do we need to have that normality checked here? We aren't going to be saved by the CLT here because we only have 10 differences. So we do need to have this assumption be met. All right. Now I know you could pull off that T statistic or you could do the test here. That p-value of 0.43 would have to be cut in half because we have a one-sided test with a positive t. Doesn't look like we have a significant gain going online based on our data. All right, we have both means and we have proportions. That's your sort of main distinction. Are we learning about a quantitative response or something that is categorical? We started out in class in our inference techniques doing proportions trying to learn about a single population proportion. And that's been identified here. Population proportion of all headache sufferers who take this new drug for which their headache is resolved within 30 minutes. We're doing a test here to see if this new drug is better than the status quo or standard rate for aspirin, which is that 70% have it resolved within 30 minutes. Are we better? Is our rate higher than 70%? We're going to conduct this test at a 5% level of significance. That's your level alpha. And it tells us that 50 people are using the study. 39 reported that it was resolved within 30 minutes. So we have 78% for p hat here. You're just simply asked, why can you use a normal 0, 1 distribution to calculate your p-value? Why is it OK to report a z statistic and find our p-value with a standard normal? What's the primary reason that leads us to that? We have two different tests you can do for a proportion. One of them is called a large sample Z test, and the other one's called a small sample binomial test. The reason why we can do this is because we have a large enough sample size. How do we know that? What are the conditions? So this is going back to proportions. It was the at least 10 rule. And we needed to have that n times p, that's what I remember, n times p. But here it would be n times p naught, because we're doing a hypothesis test. Under h naught, would you expect to see at least 10 yeses and at least 10 noes? In this case, our sample size is 50, and our p naught is 0.7. That gives us 35, which is certainly large enough. But it's really the other one that I have to check. I have to check the smaller of the two. And then the other one will be large enough if the smaller one is. And the smaller one of the two will be using the 30% instead, which is the 15. So we're OK to do a large sample Z test here and not a binomial test. Our p hat is 0.78. If you were to do the test and on the actual exam you were asked to conduct the actual test, you would have to calculate a z statistic. You can try it out as another practice. Try doing this actual test and see if you get a z statistic of 1.23 and a p value for this one sided test of about 10%. That would have come from your standard normal table, your table A1. Now, what if I only had five subjects in the study? Then I would have to do a binomial test. And if I did five subjects in the study and four of them improved or showed that their headache was relieved within 30 minutes, then my p-value would have been the probability of getting what I got, four out of five, plus anything more extreme, which would be five out of five. 
Even though in a binomial you can calculate the chance of getting just what you got, what you observed, four out of five, the p-value is always defined to be this probability under h naught of getting what you got for your statistic or more extreme. And more extreme here is greater than or to the right. All right. Well, if they were to think about redoing the test because their p-value was not quite significant at a 5% or 10%, but it's close to 10%, if they were to repeat the study with a larger sample size, say of 100, why would that be beneficial? What would be the main advantage for that? What does a larger sample size lead us to have in our testing? A more powerful test? Mm -hmm. What are some of the factors that lead to higher power? <coughs> what is power of the test again? It's the probability of what? Of making what decision? Rejecting H0, because that's what you want to do. Generally, your HA is what you'd like to support. It's the probability of rejecting H0 when the alternative is really true. That's correctly rejecting H0. And the power of the test can go up if you take a larger sample size. Because if HA is really true, and you're taking data from HA, you'll be more likely to pick it the more data you take from there, the more evidence that comes out from that HA model. What was another thing you could do to increase the power of the test? It was kind of counterintuitive to some extent, but you could do what? If you let alpha get a little bit larger, that also leads to more power because beta would have gone down and power, which is also defined to be the complement of beta, would go up. Alpha and beta, um, they compete against each other. If alpha goes up, beta goes down. They aren't complements of each other, but they do compete. And if you don't change other factors, they go in opposite direction. So if I'm willing to take 10% for alpha, I could also gain on power of my test. But I don't want alpha to be too large. I have to look at the consequences of a type 1 error. All right, proportions. More proportions in number three. So this is looking similar to the homework that you might be finishing up or having just done. I'm seeing a two-way table of counts here. The question is whether they favor this certain proposal, a survey of voters across four different city wards. We have a random sample of 200 voters from each ward. And then all the voters are asked, would you support this certain proposition or proposal, yes or no? There's our counts. So I'm looking at the table, it's a two-way table. I'm looking at my first question which says, if the proportion of residents that favor is the same for all of these wards, these populations, I'm going to be doing some work then here. What test am I going to do? It's definitely one of the chi-squared tests. Chi-squared test is not enough, though. There are three of them. It's definitely not goodness of fit, because that would be just measuring one variable for one sample. I've got four samples of 200 each. I want to assess if the distribution of opinion is the same for those four populations. So it is the test of homogeneity. not the test of independence. Now, if it really is the same for these four different wards, then I should be able to combine all the data together and come up with an overall estimate of the proportion of voters that favor. So how would I come up with that estimate for my data? Well, it's already pretty much done here, right? Your totals in that last column tell you that the overall rate of favoring, 236 out of 800 would be your overall estimate. It's about not quite 30 percent. Now if H naught, the statement of the model being the same, is true, then every ward should have about 
29% saying yes. But of course, there is some variability because this is just based on some samples. And ward number one has 76 out of 200. That's 38%. It's a bit higher. Ward number four has only 24% saying yes. So it does vary around this 29%. And the test of homogeneity will assess whether or not they're close enough to this overall rate or whether or not there seems to be some significant differences. All right, what does it ask us to do in part B? Let's look at that first cell, which is the number of people who were from Ward 1 who said favor, 76. And again, if the proportions are really the same, how many voters would you have expected in that ward to say, I favor? So I'm asking you to find, in chi-squared, you have to find these expected counts, and I'm asking you to find one of them. One of the expected counts for this particular cell. How do you find expected counts when it's a two-way table? It's that cross product rule. So I'm going to do what? Row total. So 236 times the 200 over the overall total. In other words, I'm going to take that overall rate of about 29, 30% times my n, n times the p. What I get here is, in this example, an even now 59. It is a whole number here. But if it weren't, you would leave it as a fraction. It does not have to be a whole number, because it's what you'd expect in many repetitions of the study. 79 or 76 is what we observed. 59 is what we expected. There's one of those expected counts. There are eight altogether that you could be asked to find. But chances are, if I have you do it once, I know you can do it, rather than all eight times. So that is an expectation, but it's the expected count. That's different than some of those other questions in chi-squared problems where we asked you for the expected value of your test statistic. That's a different question. The expected counts are how many people would you have expected to fall in those different cells. Now, if you were to find all eight, you could calculate your x squared test statistic, but that's been done for you. It turns out to be 10.7. That's the sum of those eight contributions to that test statistic based on the observed and expected counts. And just so I know you could calculate a test statistic in chi-squared or know what its um, form is, I'm asking you to find that contribution for that first cell. So start to calculate the test statistic in a sense. And what does the test statistic look like? Right from your yellow card, it's the observed minus the expected squared over the expected. So I want the first term for that first cell. And we just found it. We found 76 observed and 59 expected. That contribution turns out to be a pretty good amount of this 10.7. About 4.8, almost 4.9. Now here's where it will say on many of the problems, show your work. Because there is some work that I would have to do to get the answer if I didn't know what the answer was. If I don't see work and I see a right answer and there's nothing to support it and there was work that needed to be done, you might not get full credit. That's what it says on the front cover, show your work. The other thing is if you did this and you squared 16 instead of 17 because you subtracted wrong in your head, I might be able to give you two out of three points still just because you showed me all the numbers plugged in. And your answer may be off a little bit, but I can see everything plugged in looks good. So showing work usually is to the advantage of giving you some partial credit. All right, so there is the one contribution, probably the most major contribution. It's almost half of our test statistic. And I could ask you other questions there. I could have you find bounds for the p-value. What would be my degrees of freedom for this problem? R minus 1 times C minus 1. It's a 2 by 4 table, so it's 3 degrees of freedom. So if I had asked you, what would you have expected your test statistic to be here if H naught's really true, if the model's the same for all the populations? You would have expected a test statistic value of about 3. The degrees of freedom are what you'd expect for your chi-score test statistic. I didn't get 3. I got 10.7, which is a certain number of standard deviations above 3. 
and it might lead to a small enough p-value to possibly reject here then. And then I can go back to my table and say, well, it looks very different in ward 1 versus maybe ward 4 to see where those differences might have occurred. Good. You might be asked to sketch the distribution. I had someone ask me the other day, chi-square distributions do look skewed to the right. There's a couple of distributions that have this shape, where they don't have the hump part. And that's for chi-squared with two or one degree of freedom, really small ones. I'm not going to take off if you draw it with the hump and use it to mark chi-squared with two degrees of freedom, because that's the general shape of most of those distributions. But that version that way is for the smaller degrees of freedom. All right. Number four goes back to means. We're measuring how many days absent workers are over a year. Wishing to learn a little bit about the extent of that problem of absenteeism. 25 office workers' records were obtained, and they looked at the number of days they were absent over the previous year. So they have 25 measurements. And a 99% confidence interval for the population mean, number of days absent, is already calculated for us goes from 7 days to 10 days. So that confidence interval is provided for us. I'd like to get back what that sample mean was. I don't know what the population mean is. The population mean is estimated to be somewhere between 7 and 10. But you would be able to get back for me the sample mean from the study, from these 25 workers that were in the sample. That is because why? That interval was made with a formula. That formula was starting out at the sample mean and going plus or minus what we call as a whole a margin of error. That margin of error being comprised of two main parts, some multiplier times our standard error. When you have a confidence interval already made for you, you are able to get back what the best guess was, which is the midpoint, the middle. And then you could also look at how far away you go from the middle to the ends, or your half width, to get back your margin of error. I am asking for the value of the sample mean. The sample mean must be in the middle, the midpoint. So the midpoint of any range is found by doing what? Adding them up and dividing by two, finding the middle. I put down 8.5 on my final answer line, and I lose a point because 8.5 days. If I'm reading a question and it says, show your work, or remember to include the symbol in the units, I might highlight that or mark that or circle that so I don't forget to do that when I'm writing out my answer and working it through. 8.5 days. So what is the margin of error? What is this whole plus or minus part going to be? From 8.5 up to 10 or 8.5 down to 7? 1.5? 1.5 days? It's an interval of 3 units in length, so half of that is 1.5. I don't have to work out this separately or find the standard deviation itself or anything like that. I have already the information needed. Now. If you've made an interval or we've provided the interval, we might ask you to write up a sentence to describe it or its corresponding confidence level. This happens to be a 99% confidence level used here. But I'm asking you here to write a sentence to interpret the interval itself, which means I better use the 7 and the 10, because that is the interval. And we want you to often to write a conclusion in the context of the problem. It better say something about number of days absence, and in particular about the mean number of days absent, because this was a confidence interval for the mean. So let's write out a nice sentence. Confidence intervals are used to estimate what that parameter might be. We would estimate. It's always nice in the sentence to still convey what the confidence level was so that the reader knows what confidence level was used. We would estimate. We could say, kind of on the side here, with 99% confidence, we would estimate the what? We're estimating here the 
It's right in the sentence. This was a confidence interval for the, I'm going to use that phrase right there, population mean. Population mean number of ab days absence. We would estimate the population mean number of days absence for all such office workers to be what? To be between 7 and 10 days. Yes? No, well, if you got the days in your context, okay. that's okay. Make sure you don't just say population mean. Mean what? Mean number of days absent, and you've got the word days there. Yep. Now, when do we use the phrase, if we repeated this study many times? That's for the confidence level. I don't need to say we would estimate if we repeated the study many times, because I'm not going to repeat the study many times. This is my interval based on one sample, hopefully a random sample that's representative, and I would estimate the true mean to be between that 7 and 10 days. If I asked you to interpret the confidence level, you would start that other phrase. Because the confidence level is a pro uh, property of the process. It tells you how well the process works. So tell me if you were to repeat that process, how well would it work? How, what percent of those intervals would you have expected to contain, again, the population mean number of days absent? Good. Confidence intervals, confidence levels. That could be for the confidence interval for mean or a proportion, difference between two proportions, even a confidence interval for the true slope, which we've done in regression. Number five. Short little introduction here. For a particular school system, 22% of all elementary teachers are males. So what do we think about this 22%? Did the context say this came from a sample? It's a statement about the entire school system in that 22% of all elementary teachers are male. So that would be a parameter. The parameter goes with population. Sometimes we've had questions where we say, suppose salaries have a normal distribution with a mean of. 62,000. If we say that's the mean for that population or that model for that population, that's the mean for it, that's the Greek letter mu and not x bar because it didn't say it came from a sample. So this is a parameter. This parameter would be represented by what? You're looking at the percent or proportion that are male. So this would be, in our notation, a value of p. And now I'm going to consider taking a sample. Suppose a random sample of seven will be selected. How likely is it that there'll be at least two males in that sample of seven? So what kind of probability am I going to calculate here? I've got a sample size of seven. I'm measuring whether they're male or not male. I've got a success rate of 22%. It is a binomial. I'll be using the binomial distribution with an n of seven and a p of 0.22. Now, how do I want to calculate this? At least two means what? Two or more. Two, three, four, five, six, and seven. There's a lot of binomial probabilities to work out. What is not so much? The one minus. Do a complement. Well, what is the complement then of at least two? I want the probability of x being greater than or equal to two. I could find it the long way. It might take a little longer to do that. But the longer way would include the 2, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 7. So the complement is strictly less than 2, which is only going to be what values? The 0 or the 1. So I need the 0 and I need the 1. And those will be two binomial probabilities that are actually not as hard to calculate because they are at the ends.
The first one would be what? Seven choose zero. What's seven choose zero? How many ways to pick no one? One way. The 22% applies to nobody. The remaining 78% applies to all seven. So there's one term I'll have to work out. The other one is out of the seven, figure out how many ways to pick one person. How many ways are there to pick one out of seven? Seven ways. Good. Point two two raised to the one. Point seven eight raised to now just six. So then a little calculator work to work it out. The first probability of these two should be about seventeen percent. I get seventeen fifty six. The second probability that gets added on before subtracting is about 34, 68. A little bit more likely to get 1 versus 0. And therefore, the complement final answer turns out to be about 47, 48%. This requires some work. Yes, I have a calculator that could do factorials or even binomial probabilities, but I need to write out a little bit to show what I'm working out to get some credit. Now, if this were a hypothesis test with only seven observations, you would have to do it as a binomial test and find the p-value using the binomial probabilities. You've done that before, too. All right, I do have one picture of the day. It's a picture that was sent from Haiti. My husband went down there with a group to help out this one organization. And one of the things they did is they set up a zip line for the kids to enjoy. It's not very far off the ground. This is a school and a trade school and a couple things that they run there. And they're doing pretty well. They've been painting and getting the structures back to code. But they had a lot of fun setting that up, and they've had a good time. And they sent pictures of all the kids when they got back to school to try it out, and it was working well. Next year, we get to go down in the summer so I can go and help teach Vacation Bible School. Don't get to go during the school year because I'm with you. All right, we have two more problems. They're the longer ones. Six and seven. These took up longer pages on the exam last fall. What does number six start to look like? Three different methods. Group work, traditional lecture, or individual instruction with practice. A test will be given at the end. Scores on the test will be compared. We want to study if the instruction method had an effect on the scores. So I can see the setup, look ahead at the output you have, and you can obviously tell it's what kind of problem. It is a ANOVA, one-way ANOVA. Why? The response is quantitative scores. There are three different populations or teaching methods. My response variable here is the score on the test. My explanatory variable is which method was used wanting to know whether there was an effect on average. So we've got our summary data. This is already steps one and two done for us in the ANOVA part. How do we write out those classic analysis of variance hypotheses? It is about means, because analysis of variance is using variances to assess whether means are equal. Which means do we put in H0? The population ones. And there are three. And how would we write out an alternative here? You don't just write it again with not equals. You have to say it in words a little bit. It is not H naught here, too. Not H naught here means at least one population mean is different. Now, I remember on this exam, some students actually wrote out all the possibilities in H a, which you can do with three groups because it's not too bad. Either mu1 and mu2 are different, or mu1 and mu3, or mu2, and you can write out those possibilities. It's not too long of a list. If you have more than three groups, it gets to be a longer list, so this is a lot easier to write it. All right, of course, to do this test about the means, you have to calculate what statistic. All that work, those six steps to get this analysis of variance table complete to get that 
F statistic. Some of the parts are missing in the table, but it's not too hard to work them out. Obviously, if I give you two out of three sums of squares, then I'm not even really having you calculate some sums of squares. You just have to find them by subtraction. And I pulled my number off of the full data set spreadsheet, but you should be pretty close. What do we have? 63? Is that right? It depends on if you divide by the mean square, working it out that way, so there can be a little rounding error. But what about the degrees of freedom? What are your total degrees of freedom always? Your total n minus 1. Your yellow card for the yellow ANOVA part says n minus 1 there. How many students do we have all together in the study? 75, so there are 74 total degrees of freedom, which of course leaves the 72, does that also make sense from the n minus k? 75 minus the three groups. And of course our primary statistic that's missing here, by taking the 416 and the 143 and computing that ratio of the two variance estimates, we would get a F statistic of about what? 2.9, not quite 3. p-value will be provided if you need it to use a decision-making. So there's the completed table. If there is no difference among the three population means, in other words, if H0 is true, I need the distribution of the test statistic that we would use to do this test. Well, what is the statistic? It is an F. So what distribution does it have? That's the one that's right on your yellow card. I could not believe how many students did not get this one. When it says right there, under H0, the F statistic follows an F distribution with K minus 1 and N minus K degrees of freedom. Of course, we don't have to stop there with that notation because we know what K minus 1 and N minus K degrees of freedom are. They're right in my table. 2 and 72. And I could sketch that picture. I could show the p-value in picture form. It ends up being marginally significant. Significant at a 10%, but not at a 5%. In order to do the test, to use this F distribution to find the p-value, one of the assumptions out of those four assumptions in ANOVA is that the population variances are equal. And I know a lot of you missed, because you just said variances are equal. Or you told me how to check that the variances are equal with the box plots, but not what the assumption was. The assumption is that the population variances are equal. And I would like then an estimate of that common standard deviation. So if you remember, the analysis of variance statistic F was computed with two variance estimates. Those two mean squares, groups and within the groups or error, were both estimates of the common population variance. But one of them was always good, and the other one was only good if H0 is true, which we never know if it's true or not. So, which one do I use? Was the one on the top or the bottom? The video had it. Errors on the bottom. So you should use the 143. 0.57. But that's not quite yet my final answer. I need to take the square root, because I want an estimate of the standard deviation, which was in italics on the exam. And that would be about 11. The most common wrong answer that we got here was to go back to the table that you had up at the top there, where the summary was given, and students wrote down 12.3, 12.29, because that was the standard deviation across all the data set. But this is a better estimate because it pools the variability within each sample because H0 may not be true. And therefore, you need to pool within around its own mean before you combine them. So this is the correct answer. This would be the SP on your yellow card. That would be what you would use to make a confidence interval if you were asked to do that. 
which we did for individual means. One of the things we did have you do was tell where there were differences. So if alpha were 10%, we would reject H0 here. So where are the differences then at a 10% level? Let's look at the two keys output at a 90% level of confidence or 10% level of significance. And of course, it doesn't have those little asterisks anywhere to tell you where things are significant. But we are able to still use what we've got here. Method one versus method two is what we're asked to assess if there was a significant difference there between the population means. Method one versus method two is this first row of material here. And I'm going to be using that confidence interval down at the end. So what about that interval? It, what? It has a zero in it. If there's a zero in it, then mu1 and mu2 could be the same. Their difference could be zero. So the question is, is there a significant difference? Our circling would be? No. And the values that we would cite would be? That the 90% confidence interval of negative 10 to plus 3 has 0 in it. So mu1 minus mu2 could be 0. We could not refute that. There doesn't seem to be a significant difference there. The difference in the averages in the data was negative 3.8. But that was not significantly different from zero. Looking down the other confidence intervals, can you find where there was some difference? What were the two population means that seemed to be significantly different? One and three has both negatives. In this confidence interval, there is a difference. The other one that we would be looking at is two and three. And there wasn't a difference there. So we've got those three sample means listed. And we're asked to do the little visual picture that shows where things are different or where things are the same. If they're the same, you keep a line connecting them, one common line. We've established in our first question there that 1 and 2 are the same. So we have to connect them. We established that 2 and 3 were the same. It has a 0 in there, too. But that 1 and 3, the two that are furthest apart, were different. So I don't make one line across them all. I still need to connect these two guys. But it will be a separate line. So there's the picture to show it. And the conclusion generally is the idea that what? The population mean score for method 3 is significantly different, in this case higher, than the population mean score for method 1, than that method 1 score. It is population mean mu3 and mu1 that have a significant difference. If the objective is to have a higher score, which method would you like to use? Method 3. At least it's significantly better than method 1. Question? So is the underline The underline is to highlight which means still stay together, that they can't be separated. They're not significantly different. 2 and 3 had what? 2 and 3 had both a positive and a negative there, too. So there was a 0 in there. OK. How would you have drawn it if 1 and 3 were If all of them were the same, it'd be one line across them all. That would have been if you'd done it at a 5% level. Hey, guys, just a moment, please. And if it were that 3 were different from both 2 and 1, this line would not exist at all then. Good. The last question to go through is a regression one, one of our more recent topics. It did take a couple pages in length on the actual exam. There were more questions than what we have here to go through, but we'll go through a few. This is looking at the relationship between two variables that are quantitative. 
some measure of the quality of the parent-child relationship being predicted from the quality of the marriage. This is for married mothers with one child. So we have 12 observations. Our scatter plot is made here to look at that relationship. The scores on this quality index or scale are provided. What would you comment about the scatter plot? What would be some things you would comment here? I see what kind of relationship? Positive, approximately linear, which I hope if I'm doing a linear regression to fit it. Do you see any outliers at all? No? I would certainly comment on that if I did, or say that there aren't any apparent outliers. And I don't know, moderate in strength, perhaps, would be our couple of clarifiers. Our description here would be a positive, approximately linear relationship, moderate in strength, and no outliers apparent. It also does give us the averages of x bar and y bar, 72 and a 59. And in fact, that particular observation would have been a point on the line. The averages, x bar, y bar, are always one of the observations that fall on the actual least squares regression line. So you could find that value and another one and draw the line on there if you had to. All right, we have some output to use. And one of the questions says to complete our sentence here about what percent of the variation in the parent-child relationship quality, that's our response, can be explained by this linear relationship it has with the other quality measure. What am I asking you for? Mm -hmm. I'm asking you for r squared, or actually that r squared is a percent. And I find that where? Nicely right there, r squared. What do I write here, 0.583? How about 58.3. The adjusted R squared would be used if you end up having more explanatory variables in the model than just one. Because it adjusts for how many explanatory variables are in the model. We don't have to worry about it when there's only one X. We do have to use the adjusted one if there were more X's, which we didn't do multiple regression here. All right. We have one particular observation. One of the married mothers had a Marital quality rating of 68, that was their X. The observed value of Y was a 46 for that quality measure. I want the residual. So residual means I need the observed value of the response, which I have, 46. I need the predicted value of the response, which you have to get using the equation of the line. So I first need the Y hat, the predicted value. Where do I get the equation? I hope you all know how to find that. If you don't find that, then you can't do a lot of the other parts to the question. And you don't have to find it with those messy formulas. It's there. Comes right from there. The coefficients, the, the Bs, are 4.26 and a 0.76 times your X. What value of X do I plug in? Their marital quality rating was 68. Looking at the data that we had, does 68 seem reasonable to use? Yep, it's right in there. It's close to the mean. If it were way out, like at 39 or something below, I might be a little hesitant. Plugging in a 68 would give me a predicted value that's 55, 94. Now, if you don't remember what a residual is, it's defined on your yellow card. It tells you the residual is the observed Y minus the predicted. It says observed y minus the predicted y. So we observed a 46, would have predicted a bit higher, 55.94. For a negative residual, which is fine, some residuals will be positive, some will be negative. They add up to zero. They are used to graph to make checks of assumptions about the true error terms. This is one residual out of the 12 I won't have you calculate all 12, but I might have you calculate one. Now the assumption here, why they were looking at this relationship, is to assess if a higher marital quality is related with a higher level of the parent-child relationship. 
In other words, a positive association would like to be assessed here. Do the test. What's wrong with this? I know what B1 is. B1 is what? 0.76. It's not B1. It's not capital B1. It is made. It's the Greek letter which represents the true slope. If I were doing it in words, it would be the true population slope, beta 1. And beta 1, not beta 0. Sometimes the 1 and 0 are dropped off, and I don't know which one you're talking about. Beta 1 is 0. And what do I want in HA? Higher levels go with higher levels. That's indicating a positive association. Didn't say the word positive there, but the way they described what they were looking for tells you it's positive. So what's the only test statistic I should write down there? Mm -hmm. The F statistic does a test about the true slope, but it only tests the two-sided alternative of not zero. The T statistic can be used to do any of the tests about the slope, and it will do a test about zero using the one that's in the output. But the p-value here, even though it doesn't say it, is a two-sided p-value. For every t-test, SPSS gives you the two-sided one. I have a nice positive t of 3.7. I want a to-the-right test, which is just the tail area to the right of 3.7. It's giving me both tail areas. I don't want both. So we cut it in half. Question? Here first and then over here. Okay, so for the p value and the output, um, is ANOVA the only one that gives you the one tail p value? So analysis of variance. The F statistic is giving you a p value that's for that F test, mm -hmm. which is only testing the two sided alternative, though. Right. The T-test, whenever you're pulling off a T-statistic from SPSS, the SIG next to it is the two-sided one. It doesn't do a one-sided version for you. So you might have to adjust that. Was that your question, too? Um, yeah, my question was just going to be if you're going to edit on the test um, for, for the chi-squared, I do that editing. For the chi-squared test, if you remember, it has lots of test statistics. And some of those versions of the chi-squared type of statistic could be a two-sided test, so it puts two-sided in parentheses. But our chi-squared statistic only does the one-sided direction. So I usually wipe that out, cover it up, so it doesn't confuse you. For the chi-squared, you pull off the p-value as is. Which two tests do you just pull the p-value right off and don't worry about it? The f and the chi-squared. Because they're doing a one-sided test, which is all you need to do for your homogeneity or independence or whatever. All right, I think we have one more question, and it's a good one. I had some ask about it earlier. So we have a couple of different people with their scores on the marriage scale. We're going to make a prediction interval for each of them. And you're asked, with what you have here, can you determine which of the two prediction intervals are going to be wider? I would not want you to calculate the two prediction intervals to see that. That would take a bit of work. But you should be able to, with what we have here, decide which one will be wider? First of all, what did we learn? Prediction intervals are always wider than the corresponding confidence intervals for the mean. But this is two prediction intervals for two different people with two different x's. One person's x was 70 points. The other was 80. And if you remember, in the prediction interval standard error, Part of the standard error for the fit has this x minus x bar part to it. Now, the standard error fit is not what I use only. I also add in this extra s in the prediction interval one. But that's the part of the formula in the width part, the margin of error part, that's going to affect things here. Now, the s will be the same for both of them. The sample size is the same. This summation on the bottom doesn't change. That's that fixed summation that we sometimes provide you if we have you calculate one of these. It's the top here, the x minus the x bar. Which of these two people have an x value 
their marital quality rating that is closer to the average in your data set because that's where you'll have a top part there that's smallest. What was the average again? That's why we gave it to you. The average was 72. I think one of the old exams, if I remember, had one like this and one of the options was the X bar. Which one will have the narrowest interval? I think it was asking there. So it's going to be narrow when X is close to X bar. It's going to be wider when X is far away from X bar. So who is going to produce the wider interval? Kaylee with 70 or Prita with 80? Prita. Her value of X is further away from the X bar. It'll make a larger standard error. It's hard to predict when you're further from the mean. Those are our problems for review. I want to thank you for a wonderful semester, and I wish you all good luck on Thursday night.